Speculative zoology is an incredibly fun topic to talk and think about. Imagining your own creatures and coming up with unique anatomies, behaviours and evolutionary histories for them seems so appealing to many people, and such projects have become a significant presence in pop culture within the last century at least. Spec Zoo can also serve some effective educational purposes, although in many cases it is mostly a form of entertainment, since it just seems so cool to think about all the possible alternative evolutionary outcomes for various animals in the history, or indeed future, of Earth. The great popularity of speculative zoology undoubtedly has a lot to do with the iconic book After Man by geologist Dougal Dixon. Effectively starting the more modern interest in this subject, it is an integral piece of work in the history of speculative zoology. Since I recently obtained the 2018 re-release of this fantastic book, I thought now would be a good time to make a video looking back at the complete history of this science-based art form, as a sort of tribute to the incredible worlds and ideas that have been born from these works, as well as the impact they have had on science. First of all, we need to define exactly what is meant by speculative zoology. You may also have heard of the terms speculative evolution and speculative biology, and they're sort of interchangeable, however here I am going by paleontologist Darren Nash's distinction. Speculative zoology is a subset of speculative evolution and biology, but it is only the part that focuses on the alternate or future evolution of animals. So that's excluding aliens basically, since that would involve a far longer, more complicated history. It also only includes animals that are inferred to have evolved and changed over time, so not the creatures seen on old maps, since they were not thought to have evolved but to simply exist as they were. Obviously the boundaries of what you could count as speculative zoology are not exactly crystal clear, but these are the criteria I'm following here anyway. So then, what exactly was the earliest example of speculative zoology? Well, in an interview with Dougal Dixon, he explained how one of his inspirations for After Man was H.G. Wells' book The Time Machine. First published in 1895, this novel inspired and popularised a lot of things, such as the concept of time travel using a machine and also, it seems, possibly the idea of speculative zoology. In the story of The Time Machine, the time traveller first goes several hundred thousand years forward into the future, encountering two species that have descended from humans, the Eloi and the Morlocks. The Eloi are the peaceful species that inhabit the surface of this future Earth, but they are afraid of the night when the brutal subterranean Morlocks come out and capture Eloi to feed on them. After he had visited this time period, the Traveller continues to journey into the future, next going a further 30 million years. This brings him to a time where giant crab-like organisms are ruling the planet, and it's apparently this part specifically that proved to be an inspiration for Dixon. But before we get into Dixon's works, there are actually a few other projects that, while not specifically influences on After Man, nevertheless can still be classified as speculative zoology and are therefore deserving of mention in this video. The first of these is the fictional world known as Pellucidar, featured in a series of books written by author Edgar Rice Burroughs, the creator of Tarzan. Pellucidar is a world inside our own Earth, and is able to be accessed through a polar tunnel, Within this other world, there are many species of prehistoric animals, in addition to speculative organisms, such as the Mahars, giant intelligent pterosaurs with telekinetic abilities, and giant ants, which are in turn preyed on by giant mammals known as ant bears. There are also various populations of primitive humans that have formed civilizations. The first entry in this series of books was published in 1914, and the final entry in 1963, and there was actually even a crossover story at one point in which Tarzan visited Pellucidar. Next we have Last and First Men, a story of the near and far future, a novel from 1930 authored by Olaf Stapledon. This appears to be the first notable instance of a concept we see a few times in later Spexu projects, that of a future history of our own species. The book covers the next 2 billion years of human development, and follows the 17 different human species that come after the current one. The future species undergo periods of being sentient, technology-using people that design more species, to declining back into savagery once their civilizations collapse, and throughout the future history the humans move between various planets in our solar system, eventually designing a species that can live on Neptune. 
In the end, the sun destroys the solar system faster than it can be escaped, and so the final humans engineer a virus to spread out into the universe and trigger the evolution of more sentient life forms. This work has been pretty influential on many other writers, and as I mentioned, we will again be encountering some similar concepts that may have been inspired by Last and First Men. Moving to 1957, we come to an absolutely hilarious episode in this history. The invention of the Rhinograids, or Snouters. Originally published in German and later translated to English, an entire book was written about these made-up creatures. But the great thing was that it was made to look entirely serious, written in a very technical style and as if these animals really did once exist on our planet, and it's since become a famous joke amongst scientists. Authored by zoologist Gerald Steiner, the book is credited to the fictional Harald Stumpke, who was a Rhinogradentia researcher, and the work is stated to be the only known record of these fascinating animals. The reason that no other trace of the snouters exist is that they were native to an archipelago in the South Pacific, and tragedy struck their island homes when nuclear weapons testing in the late 1950s resulted in the entire archipelago sinking into the sea, killing off all the rhinograids, along with every single snouter researcher since they all happened to be attending a conference on one of the islands at the same time. So, Stumpke's account of these animals is sadly the only surviving record of them. The order Rhinogradentia contained some pretty remarkable organisms too, with over 100 different species documented in the publication. The most notable feature of these animals was a characteristic known as the Nasorium, a nose-like piece of anatomy that had evolved to perform all sorts of various tasks amongst the many species, such as locomotion and different feeding methods. All these fantastic snouters had originally evolved from a single shrew-like ancestor that found its way to the island chain, and in this way the rhinograids are a great way of illustrating how animals can evolve in strange ways in island environments, which was apparently Steiner's initial intention. So we now skip forward to 1981, when the landmark After Man, A Zoology of the Future is first published. The process that went into creating this project is really quite remarkable, and involved Dixon firstly creating the whole world of Afterman by illustrating all the creatures that inhabit it 50 million years from now, and working out their rough evolutionary history and some adaptations to the surrounding environment. Knowing how to present his idea to a publisher, since he worked in publishing himself at the time, he was immediately picked up when he suggested it, and the book began to be created. The artwork actually seen in the book, however, is not Dixon's art, but instead the work of various other artists who used the original illustrations that had been created to base their art on. Dixon also apparently made some physical models of the animals in his world, and had even produced some stop-motion animations involving the creatures. But the book is not just artworks of fanciful creatures, there's a great deal of science in Afterman too. In fact, the book, or at least the 2018 re-release that I've read, begins with an introduction to many important aspects of real, up-to-date biology, setting up the book as the educational material it was meant to be. Part of the justification for the whole project is that it is illustrating how evolution and biology actually work, but using hypothetical examples. After Man does a very good job of this, particularly in the information about the different environments that separate each section of the book, which explain what the area is like, and therefore the ways in which the future animals have adapted to them makes sense and encourages you to think about how these changes really could happen. But also, it's just a lot of fun to read about and imagine a future Earth filled with unusual yet oddly familiar animals that have descended from organisms we can see around us today. Some of my favourite examples from Afterman have to be the Raboon, the Vortex, and the Night Stalker. The Raboon, which includes a few different species, are the descendants of modern baboons that became fully carnivorous and have convergently evolved to resemble the large non-avian theropods of the Mesozoic as they hunt and scavenge on tropical grasslands. The Vortex is the largest animal alive at the time of After Man, and is a giant baleen whale-like creature that evolved from penguins. It even has adaptations of its beak that allow it to filter feed on plankton. The Night Stalker is great too. It's a giant flightless bat that hunts in packs at night. 
Night Stalkers walk on their front limbs, since they were the location of most of the large muscles used in flight by their ancestors, and their hind legs, used for grasping, hang over the top of the forelimbs and act as hands. It seems clear that After Man inspired a lot of subsequent works, since it was really the first example of a huge world-building project with a thought-out natural history for each of its inhabitants, and once it was published, the idea of speculative zoology became much more widespread. An interesting project that was actually not inspired by After Man, but represents the next major development in speculative zoology, was the creepy looking dinosauroid that first appeared in an article published in 1982, called Reconstruction of the Small Cretaceous Theropods Stenonicosaurus inequalis and a Hypothetical Dinosauroid. Now, the whole story of this creature is very interesting, as actual science was used and applied in its creation. However, there seem to be some very fundamental flaws in the design, seemingly having something to do with the personal views of the scientists responsible for the project. Of course, this is always potentially an issue with any example of speculative evolution, but it's particularly prevalent with the dinosauroid. The basic idea is that if non-avian dinosaurs had never become extinct, then intelligent species may have developed at some point. Based on research done on troodontid brain size that was coming out at the time, paleontologist Dale Russell and taxidermist Ron Seguin attempted to reason what a troodontid descendant with a human-level intelligence might look like, and produced a model of the hypothetical animal, named the dinosauroid. Looking at a lot of different animals for reference, they argued that a larger brain would cause a shortening of the face, the loss of a number of teeth, and the need to support the enlarged head directly vertical over the rest of the body, resulting in an upright stance, in addition to the loss of the tail. They also concluded that the legs of the creature would evolve to become very human-like, since they had adopted a human-like stance, and therefore the feet would also change from being digitigrade to plantigrade like our species. For this, they looked at plantigrade tree kangaroos. The result is an eerily human-looking creature, even complete with a navel betraying its supposedly viviparous nature, and it's generally agreed by a lot of paleontologists today that it is far too human-looking. Although a lot of comparative anatomy was employed, and the authors did explain all the decisions they made, as well as suggesting they may have been biased, the overall design really does seem to suggest that the authors believe the humanoid shape is inevitable and will always convergently evolve eventually. There are some clear issues with this idea, since it implies a belief that the human body structure is just the best one, and is needed in order for intelligence to arise in an organism. But in reality, there's no reason for this to be the case. The way our bodies look is the result of our specific evolutionary history, and our position as primates. An intelligent species that's a member of a totally different lineage would look more similar to the other members of that lineage than to our own species. Additionally, it's not like troodontids and other non-avian dinosaurs were even that exceptionally intelligent to begin with, more on the level of emus and opossums, and not close to ancient hominid or chimpanzee intelligence as has been suggested. As a result of all this, there was an understandably mixed reaction from the paleontological community at the time the dinosauroid was revealed, with some people praising it for encouraging provocative thought, and others criticising the clearly human resemblance. Today, the dinosauroid is not taken as a particularly serious idea of what potential intelligent non-avian dinosaurs could look like, but it still represents a significant piece of this history. Inspired by recent discussions of the dinosauroid, Paleoartist C.M. Kozman has actually reconstructed a much more plausible intelligent dinosaur called Avisapiens saurotheos, which is very notably not humanoid, but instead displays features and characteristics shared by its dinosaurian ancestors, while also being modified as a greater level of intelligence evolved. So the dinosauroid stands out as a weird but fascinating part of the development of speculative zoology. Right, we're going to have to stop there for now. I was originally planning on doing this video in one whole part, but as is so often the case, I've run out of time again, so two parts will have to do. In the second video, we'll be covering the rest of Dougal Dixon's works, The New Dinosaurs and Man After Man, as well as the more modern movement in Spexu, things such as The Future is Wild, Primeval, All Yesterdays and more. Part 2 should be up within the next few weeks, so look out for that if you liked what we talked about here. 
Thank you so much for watching this video, I really hope you enjoyed it and learned something new. If you would like to find out more about our world, its history and the wonderful life that surrounds us all, please feel free to subscribe to the channel if you think we deserve it, and if you would like to see more from us.